like to start by thanking the organizers uh, for, oh, I should stand here, shouldn't I? So I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for putting this together. Um, when we talk about cloud technology and big data, they're tremendously important to companies um, and an opportunity to get together and talk about how and what we do with them, I think, is a, is a great opportunity to share. Um, for KID, uh, big data is tremendously important. So um, let me talk a little bit about KID. KID has a very simple reason for existing. We believe that buying secondhand, secondhand goods are good for everybody. This means that um, in cultures such as the UK and the US, there's a, a common culture where people buy and sell used goods. We believe that we want to bring that culture to Thailand so people can unlock value in their home. A few years ago, we did a study where we hired a research company to go around and speak to, uh, I think, around 500 households in different cities around Thailand. And our question was simple. What do you have in your house that you're not using? We quickly found that there were lots and lots of things people just had lying around. And we've estimated that there are around 8 million items sitting, doing nothing, that are perfectly usable, which, allow, which is, has about 12 billion baht of value. One of, our, one of our goals is to help people unlock this value. So we began four years ago. We began as a small website. Today, um, we're just, we just, I think, in the end of last year, passed a billion page views per month. Uh, oh, is that not working? Thank you. Maybe this is better. OK, great. So uh, as I was saying, last year, we passed a billion page views. About 75% of our traffic is mobile. So uh, we have a heavy focus on mobile technologies. And it's worth, when we talk about big data, a billion page views is quite a lot. Um, when you add tracking multiple events on each page, so we track something in the region of probably 20, um, and each event can be cut in many different ways, we're talking hundreds of pot potential, uh, hundreds of billions of potential events. So that's pretty big. So our passion is to build an online marketplace. We want to build something that's simple, easy for people to use. Uh, we spend a lot of time trying to remove things, trying to find ways to make it very simple. Uh, we trying to remove barriers to make it easier for people to achieve their goal, which is to sell their item or buy something that they're interested in. So this is our office. You can see it's very open. We believe that by having an open office, we can facilitate communication. We believe transparency and open communication are bedrocks of innovation or growth or change. In our organization, I mean, how many people here understand what an agile process is? A few, okay. So what this means, we work very quickly. We're open to change. This is a board from uh, one, of our or one of our engineering teams. Um, I can go there today and add a new item and it'll be worked on. So this allows us to be very flexible. But let me bring this into context of kind of how we use cloud technologies and then later how we um, work with big data as well. <laughs> could really do with my speaking notes, it would really help. Uh, So the first thing we did with cloud technology was give our engineers access. This allowed anybody from the most junior engineer to start a cloud server. So if somebody wanted to try something new, if they wanted to upgrade a version of something that they were working on, very quickly it became very easy for them to just do that. Um, we found that by empowering our engineers, it gave them a foundation to learn and uh, help them develop as individuals and help, help them develop in their technical skills. 
Additionally, it helped improve our product because we could move things like dev environments and testing environments to places which had fed pretty much unlimited resources. So it improved the quality of what we were doing. And I, I think also with cloud technology, there's lots of commoditized services. And these commoditized services really help simplify a whole slew of things for us. For example, when we talk about big data, uh, building data warehouses is hard, particularly when you start building into terabytes or petabytes. And uh, AWS um, with Redshift simplifies this for everybody. Additionally, having cloud technology allows us to be very flexible. This is a, a guy I see all the time in Lumpini Park who's a yoga instructor. Um, and he's very flexible. Uh, we can fire a server up at any time. So if we want to try a new service or if something requires uh, a different kind of uh, technology, we can just start it. It takes no time at all. As I mentioned earlier, the cloud services don't just simpl simplify commoditized technologies such as queues or Spark processing or Hadoop processing or um, server management. They also allow us you know, flexibility with networking and so forth, which really makes a big difference. And of course, we can't talk about cloud unless we talk about its scale. Simply put, we can create as many servers as we like at any size that we like at any time. This, um, this is very powerful for us. Often we're developing new technologies and we don't know the demand that they're going to receive. Um, a good example is chat. So we launched chat on our platform in September. We had no idea how many people wanted to use it. So we launched this in the cloud and we launched it with a lot of servers. You know, with, with a billion page views, we weren't clear how many millions of people wanted to use chat from the day one. And so we started with a lot of servers, and then we scaled down to what we needed. And this was very effective. But when we talk about cloud technologies, there's lots of reasons to use them. But equally, you have to be aware of when not to use them. There's clearly cost. Uh, sometimes, if you want to fire up a Windows server, for example, in AWS, it's much more expensive than having your own in a data center. Uh, if you uh, want to run a very small service, having a micro instance in a cloud environment is very cheap. And so there's lots of instances where it, it makes complete sense. There are other times it doesn't. And when you start dealing with larger scale, managing reserved instances and trying to make sure that your OPEX and CAPEX is being spent evenly is very hard. And it becomes quite an, an accounting. You become an accountant more than anything. KID, we use lots of different technologies, different te cloud technologies. Each technology has its strengths. You know, Google attempts to be cheaper than everybody, but also offering a breadth of, of automation tools. A AWS has hundreds of commoditized services now, which you know, I, I find it hard to keep up with. They seem to be launching something every week now. And then there's new players like DigitalOcean. Um, we, we're building a lot of JavaScript front end um, and these developers love uh, to use DigitalOcean, and this is a cloud technology that the engineers themselves brought into our kind of tool sets. So I think it's important to make sure you're using lots of different te technologies. But let's talk about what we are doing today. I, I wanted to, I've given you kind of an overview of high level, but what are we doing? So here we're looking at our architecture from probably late last year. It's, it's a little bit outdated. But we have two data centers, one of them with True, which has a direct connect into AWS. We use a mixture of cloud providers I mentioned earlier. And in the case of True's connection with AWS, it allows us to scale into AWS if we choose. We use OpenStack technology. Uh, we use uh, lots of other technologies, but uh, we use basically a, what is called a hybrid solution. And uh, our goal here is to give ourselves as much flexibility as possible. Uh, I mentioned the example of chat. The other area we spend a lot of time in the cloud with is data. And um, we do all our tracking, um, pr data processing, and storage there. But I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I think the key thing for us, marrying cloud technology with 
local infrastructure gives us what we believe the greatest flexibility and empowers us to do what we want to do, which is find a solution and build a simple technology solution for our users. So again, I can talk more about cloud, and I'm happy to answer any questions after this if anyone has any. But I think the first major service that we really looked at using in the cloud was data. Uh, very early on, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Kaidi was a website. As I also mentioned, we, we've grown to quite a large size, and now we're 75% mobile focused, so we also uh, have apps, and our platform has grown a lot of complexity in complexity. But when we began, it was very simple. We had basically one single database. It was pretty straightforward to take an ETL script and drop the process data into a data warehouse. But as the site grew, the management of the data warehouse became more complicated. More logic was written into ETL until the ETL scripts themselves became quite hard for us to manage because they were quite complicated. Uh, and as we also gained an appetite for data, the things we wanted to know weren't simple things for us to, d to discover using simple um, SQL queries or processing data from SQL databases. So things got complicated very fast. <laughs> this is a good picture for that. Uh, and it felt very much like this. There are lots and lots of wires and we were trying to make sense of this all the time. So it required us to change the way we thought about data. So I think everybody here must know Facebook, and I think everybody here must use Facebook. Facebook has this concept of activity feeds. This was a paradigm shift for us at KID. We started to think of data as activities. We started to think of data as st streams of events. And, uh, with this shift became a whole host of changes around how we collect data, how we process data, and how we analyze data. So the first thing we did is we started to log everything. We took away the concept of SQL, of querying databases, because one of the challenges we had is we had many services with many databases at this point, and so querying lots of data in lots of databases became very complicated. So we just created a very simple engine that dropped a little text file um, which gave a description about something. And we did that for everything. This grew very, very quickly. And when things like this grow very quickly, you've got to put it somewhere. And we, I mean, I think we were growing at, at early days was 30 gigabytes a day. Uh, today, I, I couldn't even tell you what it is, but it's certainly, not, it's certainly a lot more. Uh, so you need a, a huge place to put all this data. And this married well with cloud technology. Um, we tried both Google and Amazon and ended up using Amazon S3 uh, for lots of different reasons. But uh, for us, it's very powerful because it doesn't, we, for fairly, it's very cheap for us to store what could be considered quite a, a large amount of data. But, <laughs> As most things, when you start, you don't always get it right. So in our case, we started and we had this concept of we create a reservoir, but how do we take this data and actually make it something useful? And so we created a pipeline for us to process data to actually mine insights. And this is a great metaphor for our first pipeline. It had lots and lots of holes. Uh, and we realized very quickly gaining quality data or collecting quality data was really hard, uh, particularly at scale. So from that, we built this. And so this is a up-to-date uh, architecture diagram of our current pipeline. Uh, what you can see here is our, our apps on the left-hand side, which are shipped using a, a small program called FluentD which is a log shipper, and it's quite powerful because it has lots of plugins that allow us to actually enrich the data. Uh, and this enriching of the data allows simple things such as IP addresses can be converted into geographical locations. User agent strings can be translated into devices or operating systems or things of this nature. 
And then we take these text files and we put them into our reservoir, which is S3. From here, we have two streams of data. One is batch, which can happen anything in, the, in 10, 15, 20 minutes to uh, days, weeks if necessary, um, but most things are daily. And this is really very operational data. Uh, and here we, we started to heavily use Spark because of the size of the data. So we have a 24-hour running Spark instance, which we're doing lots of uh, distributed processing. And on the other side, we have stream data. And this is what we consider real time. It's not really real time. I mean, it's, you know, at the moment, we consider less than one minute real time. Uh, one, it's soon. In the future, we'll reduce that. That's a choice at the moment, mostly based around cost. Uh, but this is tremendously powerful for, us, powerful for us because all we do is we take that little text file or we select the text files we're interested in and we put them into an Elasticsearch cluster. And then we have a whole bunch of different visualization tools that connect to that cluster which allow us to do real-time analysis. Okay. So as I was talking, this is uh, our current architecture. There's one thing I, I forgot to mention. So we have this concept of batch in real time, but for us, the diagnostic piece is pretty critical. And this comes back to the leaky pipe. This allowed us to very quickly find out where the leaks were and slowly and steadily remove them. And so today, we use lots of different technologies. Uh, these are the principal ones. Uh, I think, uh, guys, most people will know them. I think Ansible and Docker are very powerful for us in a way to automate and scale. Uh, Elastic, I think, is in the center of our platform in many ways. Um, we use Elasticsearch also for browsing and searching on our platform. Um, so it's, uh, it's becoming a, a very important technology for us. I believe we'll be hosting an event in our office actually in March where we've invited uh, Elasticsearch APAC to come in and talk. Spark is also becoming pretty important for us because it's become an easy way for us to, to process data at scale. And from the visualization layer, um, we're using a lot of MicroStrategy, which is a great tool for uh, uh, building visualizations and adding some business logic where you need. But uh, what we have today isn't perfect. It still has a lot of problems, and we still continue to improve it. So uh, I found a picture to represent that. So this is our kind of technology today. It's still a work in progress. So how does this drive innovation? So it's great, we got data. But data isn't very useful to people if they can't get to it. And data really isn't very useful if you're not using it to make decisions. So this processing of the data is very important. Uh, I think this is key. I, I went, to see a, uh, went to a conference a few years ago where the chief scientist for Amazon talked about their, their attitude, and they said, he said actually that he considered data to be like oil. It's great that you've got a lot of it, but unless you're refining it, it's not really worth anything. Um, and he also shared that Amazon has been collecting every piece of data that it can from 1999. So think how expensive that would have been um, in the early days without cloud or other ways to store such mass volumes of data. So. Does anyone know this picture? So there was a man called John Snow in 1854. He's a doctor, and there was a cholera outbreak in uh, Broad Street in London, in uh, the Soho uh, district, and lots of people died. And this is quite a famous uh, diagram because what John did is he put dots where people died, and the dots became larger the more people died. And what this represents is where the water pumps are and where the people who died were. And it became very, I think very quickly you can see that they're clustered mostly around that pump right there in the middle. And he discovered that that was actually contaminated and the source of the cholera. So what we're trying to do isn't new. This has been around for centuries. So this is a real version of something we do. It's not life-threatening, so it, it, it only helps us make our product better. Here we're looking at a product that we launched this week. 
And it's looking at the top, the amount of people who see it, to the bottom, the amount of people who are using it, uh, and the various conversion rates that go through it. This particular data is probably within 20 seconds, and we can look, it, look back to the beginning of the product. So what we do here is we'll make changes. We'll change colors, we'll change positioning, we'll even change whole pages, and then we'll see how it affects uh, these, these stats. This is uh, mostly driven by the UX team, uh, but there's also marketing people involved and so forth, so it's getting the data to the people who can actually use it. And I think if there's one thing I can say about innovation, if you don't have data agility, if you cannot get the data from your store to someone's hands, there's no point. So I mentioned chat. This is chat data, uh, looking back last week. So Thais like to get on chat at 9 p.m. at night. That's <coughs> what this tells me. Um, so we, we see a lot of activity late in the evening, actually. And this helps us decide how we're going to scale, for example. It also helps us know uh, when um, it's the most valuable time for an ad to be at the top of a list, for example. So the, again, this is something used by our product team and also used by our operations teams. But we can also see that on Android, it doesn't matter. Because people aren't focused just at 9 p.m. except for on a Friday night. Uh, in most days, it's completely steady from 9, PM, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. And so that's a different kind of, a different view of the same data. And we can take it a step further and look at things such as telephone calls and uh, chat contacts or email contacts or many other ways that people contact in our platform. Then there's more operational data. Uh, this is looking at posts and um, the amount of people who are adding to our platform. And guess what? It's not surprising, really. At Songkran, not many people are adding on our platform. We see these big dips. And we've done lots of studies around this where we're predicting where we're going to have peaks of traffic and where we're going to see dips. And we know when to pull back on our marketing spends so that we use them in the best place. It tells us that what, how many staff we need to have in our office to cover. Uh, and you know, this kind of data, can, if used well, can save us lots and lots of money. So within marketing, we track uh, our customer lifecycle. And our interventions, this is a push campaign. So we do a lot of uh, marketing-related mar uh, pushes, which is uh, basically uh, the little banner that appears on your phone as a notification. And here, this is actually a failure because we can see the, these peaks, but there's no sustained peak. This should be a, a, a pyramid or a, a triangle. But instead, we see a, a big peak of where people respond, but not, not many people stick around. We also get subjective data from our users. So this is Net Promoter. So this is a, a banner that pops up on the site and asks people a very simple question. Would you recommend us to your friends? We've been doing this for a few years now. And this is, uh, I think, November's. I can't see this. And what we can see here is in November, or December, oh, December, we've broken tablet. People who are using the tablet aren't as happy as people who are using mobile phones or even desktops. So this tells us where we need to put focus uh, for our product roadmap. Or it tells us that there's a system problem of some type. What's also great about Net Promoter is we get lots of feedback. Lots of people like to tell us what we're doing well and, lots, and tell us what we're not doing so well. So we can also focus on those things. So to sum all this up, cloud technology empowers people here, mostly technical people. Uh, though even our data scientist is, is firing up servers himself now. It increases our velocity, allows us to change quickly and grow quickly. When we do TV adverts, we see massive spikes of traffic. It allows us to account for that without having, spend, having to spend large amounts of money on local infrastructure. Procuring servers takes a lot of time. We can just fire up a new server and then procure it and then replace it later. So it really gives us a lot of uh, flexibility. And but all this comes with a price. And we're always 
looking at this price and trying to do a trade-off between data center, which we could consider CapEx, and the cloud, which we can consider OpEx, renting. And often it's much more effective to buy than rent, and sometimes it's much more effective to rent rather than buy. It's a common decision. I think one other thing to be said about cloud as well is it also empowers collaboration. So we have sister companies in uh, Vietnam, and they wanted to launch chat. So we already had a chat solution. So we could just fire up a new one for them in their cloud instance, which you know, took us two hours. Uh, and then they could work on that and, and customize it in the way that they wanted. And data. At the core, we need, we, you need to collect everything. I think often you don't know the question you need to ask. Or the question you're asking, later on, you find is leading to another question. And if you don't have everything, you, you won't have the data to, ask, to find the answer. And this core of collecting everything, I think, it really gives your organization a great deal of flexibility. Refine it. And ideally, find a cheap, commoditized way to do that. For example, Elasticsearch has the Elk stack, which allows you to do very simple aggregation on the fly. And if you can just drop a, an event into a JSON file, you can, you can very quickly get a lot of insights. It doesn't take a lot of time, and it's something you could do in a few hours. And when you have data, you have to get it democratized. You have to get it to the people. Otherwise, there's no point refining data and putting it into a spreadsheet if people don't have access to it. And so uh, we believe that data should drive decisions. And for innovation, you have to empower the team. Without an empowered team, they can't take decisions or make decisions based on the data that you're collecting. Um, the best I could say is by marrying cloud technology and data, you can empower teams. You can, get gain, you can gain speed and flexibility, and you can get <coughs> data into people's hands. And that allows people to experiment and play and find answers to questions that will drive your business. I think that's my last slide. Yeah. So uh, anyone have any questions? No one? You, you have stated earlier about manage data as an um, event. Could you give a little bit more explanation of it? So this, this idea of moving to activity for your feed fields or feeds was really about state. So in our case, we, we have ads and members. We have a customer's life cycle. We have an ad life cycle. And they go through lots and lots of states. You know, you have a, a new ad who hasn't been contacted. You have an ad that's been contacted by telephone, but not by email. And so we've, we became very difficult for us to get the fidelity that we wanted. And so by creating events, and so in this case, we have an ad insert with a timestamp. Then we have a contact event which, with a timestamp. We can see time to first contact. We can see the count of contacts associated by the ad ID and so forth and so forth. And so it became a different way of thinking because originally we were trying to structure our data into databases, which became very complicated. You know, trying to take that same paradigm, time to first contact is a, a, you know, an SQL statement, of course, but it means that you have to start putting in large data sets. Whereas here we just start pulling out the files that we need by querying text files, uh, which is particularly suited for technologies such as Hadoop and, and, and big data. Does that answer your question? Anybody else? Oh, okay. I have a mic here. OK, great. Could you come back to the Kaidi today, the hybrid cloud? The hybrid cloud, show? yes. So just want to know, today you are hybrid on your hosting and how you are um, kind of the mix on two sides, your hosting and manage your server by yourself with your team and also <laughs> use the cloud. Yeah, so I, I have a look at that, and it's still confused on some, some... Yeah, it's still confusing to us, too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
thank you. <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, so this, this is actually from a deck from the infrastructure team and how they wanted to do it. Uh, and, and today, it's, 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 it is accurate for us to today, but it's not perfect. So we're moving to OpenStack. Uh, we have certain technologies already implemented, some we're implementing. Uh, we use Docker um, on some services. And Docker, for example, I thought has, has really kind of turned to be a, a powerful tool for us because it means we can actually get the infrastructure in the engineer's hands, which, you know, when you have an, an ops team, you know, you need to give them as much time as possible to look after the infrastructure and not have to uh, be managing every aspect of, the, of your services or platforms. And so today, I would say we have a legacy data center and a data set center set up as we would like it to be, about 70%. And we've got a plan to finish that remaining 30%. Um, and I think at our core, OpenStack would be a key technology for us in the sense of removing multiple virtualization technologies and centralizing on a single one so that we can then scale much more efficiently um, into different places. So mostly you host your, your um, kind of web tier or application tiers on the cloud, right? No. Or database no, no. or? In the case of... Uh, we, we used to work a lot with Sonoc, so we've, we've learned a lot from, from their, their infrastructure. And I, I think uh, there's some things you just want to do locally, connected directly to the Thai local internet. And so when we talk about image delivery, uh, page delivery, those things happen from within our data centers. We don't use cloud technology for that. Oh, for local, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. We, may, we may scale uh, some of our caching into the cloud, but only if we hit massive peaks. Oh. Um, it's, it's, not a ch it's not the first choice. So that's why you balance the cheap and expensive one yeah, that yeah. you talk about? Yeah, exactly. And, and I, I think the, the other point here is there's some things that just um, don't require real time, like speed. And so when you're talking about like image delivery, for example, I want it to happen in five milliseconds. So caching I, is work. Yeah, I want it to be fast. Um, when you talk about chat, you send me a message. I don't think I if it takes three seconds, you care. And so there's certain services, I think, that work re very well in the cloud um, where others don't. And, and that's why we have this mixture of local versus um, cloud technologies. And uh, today, I mean, honestly, um, our platforms gained such a complexity. Well, I'm sorry, I've got to wrap up. <laughs> that I couldn't even tell you all the services we're currently running and where they reside. Uh, I just can't keep track of everything. <laughs> there's too many services now. I, I think that's the last question, or do we have, oh, one more? Uh, I would like to know uh, what is your opinion about the data scientist roles in your company? Okay, that's a good question too. Um, I hired one as soon as I could. <laughs> um, very, very hard to find in Thailand. Um, and I, I think, uh, I think this could be said about a lot of data technology expertise. There's not, uh, it's not a lot of people here who've had a lot of experience. Um, but it, it's critical, I think, to pick somebody and invest in them. And for us, you know, we, we, when we started our data journey, uh, we couldn't find anybody to help us. Uh, well, we could find this Indian company that wanted to charge us like, you know, a million dollars. <laughs> but of course, we didn't want to spend a million dollars on something we didn't really understand. So uh, we began by sending people to conferences we began by hiring people who we believed had the right kind of attitude um, and investing in them. And, and, and we've done that now for three, four years, and, and it seems to have worked out okay, and we're going to continue to do, it, do that. Okay? Okay. Do we have time for one more? Okay. So, uh, you mentioned one slide uh, that politicians in the United States are like, but you really need more than this because the regulations for them to be efficient, they need to do clusters. Mm. Okay, another good question. So how, how, do, how do you, uh, to paraphrase what you've said, is how do you kind of uh, scale collecting everything across your services? Um, or how do you actually do that? <laughs> uh, well, you don't, is the short answer. I mean, you can never really truly collect everything. Um, but for us, I mean, we, we made it as simple as possible. Uh, and I think any engineer knows that if they can put it into a JSON format and dump it into a file that we can collect it. 
And so th I think that's the essence of what we did. We simplified the process of collection to the point that everybody could do it. And yeah, I mean, it's talking about our data scientist, he just handed me a presentation on, on how to improve the accuracy of our data because we have lots of different formats. And it's one of the projects we're looking at now is trying to adding like data profiling tools and uh, uh, creating better schemas so that the, the events we're collecting are, are clearer. But this, this, I mean, as your data, if you, if you collect the data, even if it's dirty, you can clean it. Um, and it's better that you've got it so you can clean it rather than you don't have it. And as it becomes important, you, go, you often go back and just clean it up. I mean, it's, and, and like I said, it's just a JSON file. So often, if it's hooked into, say, a web front end, you just log into the web front end and do a bit of cleanup, and then boom, you're done. It's not, it's not hard. So that's, that's probably the key for us. OK, well, thank you, guys. And uh, we have an open invitation to anybody who'd like to learn more. Please um, organize uh, to come to KID. <coughs> we'll be happy to share. We host a lot of events now at KID. Um, so if you hear of anything or you'd like to host an event, come talk to us, and we'd be happy to help. OK, thank you. <laughs>